you know what the most important job your kidneys perform is? It's removing toxins, the harmful intruders that threaten your health every day. That's why, if your goal is to improve kidney function, the first thing you need to do is minimize the amount of toxins your kidneys are exposed to daily. When you do that, something miraculous happens. You may witness a transformation that could turn back time on your kidney health. Don't miss my number one tip, as this method has been used on a stage 4 patient to bring him back to stage 2. Number 8. First, start by eliminating a toxin that not only causes bad breath and nausea but also erodes your kidneys and bones as if you had placed them in an acid bath. That's right, I'm talking about excess acid in the blood, or metabolic acidosis. If you want to avoid giving your kidneys an acid bath every day, including at parties, start with your diet. My first piece of advice here is to include as many alkaline foods as possible in your meals. This mainly consists of fruits and vegetables. Acid-forming foods versus alkaline foods. As you can see, protein and fat-rich foods are almost as bad for your kidneys as salt on a wound, while grains are neutral. Fruits and vegetables are the alkaline heroes we need. Typically, Greens like kale, spinach, or arugula are among the most alkaline foods out there. But let's be honest, the goal here isn't to find the most alkaline food of all time, spoiler, it's spinach, but rather to find alkaline foods that you'll actually eat without feeling like you're forcing yourself. What about lemon water? Many people love starting their mornings with lemon water, and that's great because, while it's true that squeezing a lemon removes fiber and some vitamins, you still get all the alkalizing benefits this fruit provides, plus the hydration from the water. So, what other juices can you make to stay hydrated while getting alkaline benefits? Generally, vegetable juices are great. Combine your favorite veggies and juice them for a super healthy drink. One recipe you can try is cucumber, kale, pineapple, and lemon, it's incredibly refreshing and hydrating. Another one of my favorites is cucumber, celery, spinach, apple, and ginger. It's packed with health benefits and has a spicy kick. Of course, you can also use the same vegetables to make smoothies and get extra fiber and vitamins in the process. Now, on to my second piece of advice, stay away from dangerous diets. Seriously, folks, if your goal is to prevent kidney damage, avoid extreme diets. Let's talk about metabolic acidosis again. Remember that acid bath I mentioned? This is often caused by end-stage kidney disease or very poor eating habits. Think eating meat three times a day. I've seen early-stage kidney disease patients who, despite eating what I thought was a fairly decent diet, still suffered from metabolic acidosis. They shouldn't have had that problem, I thought, not without end-stage kidney disease. Do you want to know the culprit behind their metabolic acidosis? Yes, I know fasting is all the rage these days, as if it's some holy grail of health. But for people with kidney disease, it can throw your metabolism into chaos. Let me explain, when you fast too much, your body switches to producing ketones for energy, just like in a keto diet. But wait, aren't ketones supposed to be good? Not if you have diabetes or kidney disease. This process generates a large amount of acid, which can overwhelm the kidneys. This is called ketoacidosis. So, avoid fasting, there are easier and safer ways to lose weight. Like, I don't know, anything that doesn't involve destroying your kidneys by turning your blood into acid. Number 7. Sodium Bicarbonate If you truly have metabolic acidosis, meaning your carbon dioxide level is below 22, you need sodium bicarbonate or, better yet, a prescription from your doctor. Always make sure your carbon dioxide level is being monitored and that it is at least 23 or higher. 
there are patients with a serum bicarbonate level of 20 who are not prescribed sodium bicarbonate by their nephrologist. Why? Because different laboratories may define normal ranges differently for certain values. Some labs only mark mid-20s as too low, but for CKD patients, even 21 is already too low. Even if a lab report states that a value is within range, that is not always correct, it should be at least 22. You will feel much better with a carbon dioxide level of 23 or 24, and that's why you need a competent doctor. Number 6. Next, let's talk about detoxification. Proteinuria is a major issue for people with chronic kidney disease, and the first thing you want to do is follow a low-protein diet. This is something very easy to remember. The first treatment for proteinuria is a low-protein diet. So, try to remember this. Protein, proteinuria, protein, proteinuria, protein, proteinuria. This is something you need to keep in mind forever. Yes, that's what you do to reduce your proteinuria levels. Avoid protein. Now, when most people think about reducing protein intake, they think about avoiding meat, fish, and cheese, which is a good start, no doubt, but that's just the beginning. You see, the amount of protein needed in a kidney-friendly diet, even for those without proteinuria, is very small. This means that by eating foods not commonly considered high-protein, like bread, rice, pasta, beans, nuts, and more, you can easily exceed your daily protein target. This is a big problem because a low-protein diet can make a huge difference in reducing proteinuria and, you know, helping you avoid dialysis, but only if you truly stick to a low-protein diet. So, what should you do? First of all, you need to be very careful with foods like beans, nuts, and even things like bread and rice. You might want to have someone who knows what they're doing set up this diet for you. The amount of protein you need is so low that you even have to be cautious with foods that aren't usually considered high in protein. Number 5. Next, let's talk about supplements and measures that can help reduce proteinuria. Many things can help, including but not limited to vitamin D, garlic supplements, and omega-3s. But if you ask me to point out the most effective supplement against proteinuria, I would say cordyceps. Cordyceps is extremely powerful in preventing proteinuria. One study showed a 36.7% reduction in protein levels in the urine. Remember, what helps reduce proteinuria also benefits overall kidney health. In fact, some patients have been able to lower their creatinine levels by 31 to 46 percent within just a few weeks of taking cordyceps. Another reason I like cordyceps is its safety profile. This is one of the supplements that almost anyone can use. Number 4. Another substance we want to eliminate is excess fluid. In fact, having too much fluid volume in your body is a cause of high blood pressure. So, how do we get rid of this excess fluid in the body? First of all, by making the right dietary choices. Chronic kidney disease, CKD, treatment places a heavy focus on diet, and finding the right foods can really help. Let's start with an underrated diuretic superfood. No. I'm not talking about some expensive magic powder from a health guru, I'm talking about dandelion greens. It turns out they're actually edible, and not only edible, but also a natural diuretic. This herb can safely and gently stimulate your body to get rid of excess fluid. Dandelion greens are also linked to lowering blood pressure, reducing inflammation, and even improving blood sugar control you can add them to salads. Another food you might want to consider for your salad is asparagus. This superfood is one of your kidney's best friends. This little green powerhouse is a diuretic, and research has proven it, thanks to a special amino acid called asparagin. 
Asparagus not only helps reduce water retention but also treats swelling. So, if your ankles are puffing up like pool floaties, add asparagus to your diet. A fun fact, that weird smell in your urine after eating asparagus? That's just asparagin doing its job. Pro tip, if you cook asparagus until it's mushy, you're destroying its valuable nutrients. Instead, try eating it raw, grate it into a salad. Next up is celery, a vegetable that gets bullied for being low in calories and basically solid water. But here's the interesting part, celery is actually packed with nutrients and has some serious diuretic power. Thanks to a compound called phthalides, celery acts as a natural vasodilator, helping to fight high blood pressure. Now, let's be clear, these veggies. You can juice them, toss them in a salad, or blend them into a smoothie. I don't care if you have to sneak them into your meals like a parent hiding veggies in mac and cheese, there's always a way to include them in your diet if you're serious about fighting water retention. It's time to eat your greens, because water retention is, of course, a major issue for CKD patients. Number 3, let's talk about diuretic supplements, but not those shady herbal supplements that might mess with your prescription meds. We're looking for the good stuff, essential vitamins and minerals. In fact, certain vitamins and minerals can actually make the diuretics your doctor prescribes work even better. First up, vitamin B1, also known as thiamine. Why is this important? Because a B1 deficiency can cause you to retain water, which is ironic because diuretics, the very things meant to help you, can actually cause that deficiency in the first place. So yes, your diuretics might be indirectly sabotaging you. That's special, isn't it? Make sure you're not B1 deficient. Next on the list, vitamin C, the king of detox. Not only does it boost your immune system, but it also helps your body flush out excess fluid like Marie Kondo tidying up your body. When you touch something that doesn't spark joy, you feel it. So if you're low on vitamin C, you're basically saying, no thanks, I'd like to hold on to all this water. And of course, there are essential minerals that can also cause water retention if they're too low. One of them is potassium, which might surprise you. Potassium, the thing you've been scared of. But here's the interesting part. While hyperkalemia, too much potassium, is a real concern, hypokalemia, too little potassium, is just as dangerous. A potassium deficiency can lead to water retention, and it can be caused by loop diuretics. So be very careful with this level, make sure you're monitoring your serum potassium regularly. Now, there's one nutrient even more important when it comes to water retention. This nutrient is often very low in people with chronic kidney disease, and without it, your body's ability to handle fluid can be compromised. If you don't get enough of this nutrient from food or supplements, swelling can be a direct consequence. But you might also struggle with sleep, and in extreme cases, even develop depression. Vitamin B6 is crucial for hemoglobin formation, metabolism, brain function, and it also regulates fluid balance in the body. Studies have found evidence that increasing B6 intake can directly help reduce water retention. Research also links low levels of this nutrient to inflammation, yet another reason to make sure you're getting enough B6. Now, perhaps the most important nutrient in fighting water retention is magnesium. This mineral is involved in over 300 enzymatic reactions that help your body and kidney system function properly. Recently, magnesium has been making headlines because low levels of this mineral are linked to faster kidney function decline and earlier death. Unfortunately, in people with CKD, this mineral is often too low. If you're deficient in magnesium, not only will your kidneys start deteriorating faster, 
but you're also inviting high blood pressure, thyroid problems, phosphorus imbalances, and a quicker progression to kidney failure. Trust me, a magnesium deficiency definitely does not spark joy. Keep an eye on this mineral and consider supplementing if needed. Number 2. Now, let's talk about another toxin that you definitely want to eliminate from your kidneys. Just like the other toxins we've discussed today, we will look at both dietary changes and some measures to remove this toxin. So, what is the most dangerous toxin for your kidneys? The toxin we should focus on eliminating the most is excess phosphorus. In fact, medical literature has documented cases where CKD, chronic kidney disease, patients were able to move back two stages in their kidney disease simply by controlling their phosphorus levels. But how do we do that? First and foremost, through diet. Now, eliminating phosphorus is less about what you eat and more about what you avoid. Perhaps the most important part of a kidney-friendly diet is avoiding foods high in phosphorus. Some common food sources of phosphorus include dairy products, red meat, poultry, and seafood. Processed foods such as deli meats, bacon, sausages, sodas, and sports drinks are also high in phosphorus because phosphates are used as food preservatives. Foods like baked goods, breakfast cereals, sauces, and many packaged products can also be rich in phosphates, and these should be completely avoided. So, always check the labels of what you buy. Now, there are other foods that contain phosphorus but do not need to be completely avoided. These include beans, nuts, whole wheat bread and grains, and certain vegetables like asparagus, tomatoes, and cauliflower. These foods contain some phosphorus, but they don't concern us. Why? Because not all phosphorus is created equal. Plant-based phosphorus is like a colleague working remotely, it's technically present, but it doesn't really do much. Phosphorus from animal sources and additives, on the other hand, is working overtime and actively damaging your kidneys. So, to summarize, always avoid meat, fish, dairy products, and processed foods with added phosphates, and don't worry about grains, nuts, and seeds. The phosphorus they contain isn't as harmful, avoiding them won't make a difference. But do you know what can actually help lower your phosphorus levels? Number 1. Our number 1 today is a vitamin that acts as a phosphate binder. In fact, to control phosphorus, you may also need a detoxifier or a phosphate binder. I often recommend calcium carbonate. However, in this case study, they didn't use that to lower phosphorus levels in this patient. As you can see, to bring this patient back to stage 2 from stage 4, they used a special form of niacin, or vitamin B3. That's all for today. Thank you for watching. God bless you, and take care of yourself. Goodbye.